Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, hate gets a foothold in a new generation. New Jersey bias crimes are still on the rise, disturbingly at schools and college campuses. Months after his predecessor was recorded on tape spewing what some considered hateful speech, see how the new sheriff of Bergen County combats hate. There's a new attraction on the boardwalk of Ocean City, and it's not food or entertainment. Plus, next year, you'll need a new real ID, how the Motor Vehicle Commission is getting ready to replace millions of driver's licenses. And the slime green cyanobacteria has infected two more lakes. We'll tell you where they are and what not to do. With those stories and more next on NJTV News. <laughs> from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us on air and online. Recent acts of terrorism fueled by hate have led the state to create a special task force to tackle bias incidents. What's given it urgency is an attorney general's report that identifies the age of many of the perpetrators. Here's senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan. The latest bias survey documents, quote, a rising tide of hate at New Jersey schools and universities and says among those arrested for hate incidents, almost half are minors, mostly white, mostly male. In Middlesex County, one third of reported bias incidents have occurred at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, where white supremacists posted flyers like these in dorms to recruit members. But students of all ages have noticed an uptick. We see this happen on a general basis, not only in campus but just in our regular lives at work just walking in the street all these things happen I just thought since we was like a different era different age that like you know we're supposed to be more accepting of people I just didn't think stuff like this would still happen especially since we're so young I think that's unfortunately not hundred percent surprising because we have seen how much uh, these movements have been trying to target young people um, the use of social media targeted social media ads and YouTube have been used the report shows bias incidents on the rise overall from 549 in 2017 to 569 last year. More than 25% each year occurred at colleges and universities. One half the incidents being reported occur on college campuses or universities or in elementary schools. Yes, that is a crisis. And the number of known offenders who were minors skyrocketed from about a third in 2017 to 46% last year. That alarmed state officials who pointed to possible causes. Social media, political rhetoric, and the rise in hate groups. Posts that tap into negative emotions like anger or fear can engage users. Um, and also, as you know, um, the perpetrator, it appears that the perpetrators of several recent massacres have posted uh, hate-filled white nationalist attacks on social media. The report prompted Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver to sign an executive order creating a new interagency task force to combat youth bias. It'll study root causes, review existing programs, and investigate possible solutions to reducing bias at schools. Officials would not comment on recent New Jersey cases of alleged hate speech, one involving Tom's River School Board member Dan Leonard, who's retiring at year's end, the other case involving Jerry Scanlon, a Sussex County Community College trustee and county Republican chairman who remains under investigation, the attorney general condemned hateful political rhetoric. Our topic couldn't be more timely or more urgent given what's taking place across our country right now. If our elected leaders, uh, regardless of what position they hold, showed greater restraint in their political speech, we might see greater restraint among the population more broadly, uh, especially young people. The task force gets six months to compile and analyze information. It'll submit a report to the governor. In Newark, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Meantime, some law enforcement and faith groups are taking action to combat hate before it can take root. And U.S. Senator Cory Booker's campaign took him to a place where hate has already maimed a community. Michael Hill is on the Booker beat. 
let us take a moment. A moment of silence at Mother Emanuel Amy Church in Charleston, South Carolina, where four years ago a white supremacist 45 caliber gun blast shattered the solemnity and slaughtered nine African Americans. Today, presidential hopeful and Senator Cory Booker stood in the same church. He did not mention the president by name, but he condemned the weaponizing of hate. White supremacy allows political leaders to promise to build the wall while not building hospitals, schools, or infrastructure critical for the success of all Americans. It talks about the invasion of immigrants while allowing the deadly opioids to invade our communities, kill our children, lower the life expectancy of Americans and white men in particular. A clerical error and a background check that took longer than three days enabled the shooter to buy the gun. Booker said it was time to close that waiting period loophole, ban assault weapons used in other mass shootings, and have federal licenses for guns. It is a common sense policy and one that we know from the evidence and the data will actually save lives. And we've got to go further. We must require that the Department of Justice, Homeland Security, and the FBI conduct assessments of the domestic terrorist threats that are posed by white supremacists to take this more seriously, to act on the threat. Booker said apathy and indifference contribute to the violence, lack of action, and hate now and decades ago in America. Were you afraid? Of course I was. I was very afraid. I really was. Dwana Kyles braved the hateful speech, stares, and segregation when she was five years old. She was one of 13 children to desegregate Memphis public schools in 1961. Today, Kyles battles racism by telling the story and struggle of the Memphis 13, a story she shared at the Bergen County Sheriff's Department with students from Inglewood High School and the private Frisch School. So did T.M. Garrett, a former neo-Nazi turned human rights activist, filmmaker, and collaborator with the Simon Wiesenthal Center. What was the eureka moment you said, look, this is not right? Well, first I got disengaged from the groups itself. It was just a lot of pressure. I didn't want to go to prison, and that is something you probably end up in prison or either being dead or dead. I didn't want to do that, so I left those groups, but in my head I was still a racist. And that changed when I received compassion from somebody I hated before. That was my landlord. He was a Turkish Muslim, and he just showed me that compassion when I thought I didn't deserve it. That was very important to me. That had to do with respect and dignity that we often don't see nowadays, but still everybody but he needs to learn that these things are important. Last fall, Anthony Curitan was the president of the Bergen County NAACP, then voters elected him sheriff. He organized this combat hate program, inviting the NAACP, the Urban League, and the Wiesenthal Center. We live in a time where people just, they're not listening to each other, they're not engaging with each other, they're staying within their own bubbles, and we need to have these shared experiences so that we can learn the lessons from our past, from, from our history. Critics have argued Sheriff Curitan's predecessor, Michael Sordino, should have embraced the anti-hate message after recording captured Sordino spouting racist and homophobic remarks about two Murphy administration officials and African Americans forcing his resignation last September. In other words, let the blacks come in and do whatever they want, smoke the marijuana, yeah. do this, do that, and don't worry about it. You know, we'll tie the hands of cops. The current sheriff says combating hate goes well beyond this county. If you look throughout the country, look internationally, we have had this situation where people are attacking each other based on their race, color, skin, and religion. So we believe kids coming together under this type of circumstances gives an opportunity to really open up the dialogue. And when we talk about hate and bigotry, never there's a dialogue until something happens. So we look at it as being proactive to having that discussion. In Hackensack, Michael Hill, NJTV News. To track the senator's coast-to-coast -coast quest for the White House, head to thebookerbeat.org, where you can find the most comprehensive coverage, including exclusives from NJTV News and NJ Spotlight journalists embedded with the campaign. A new wage law is put to the test. That tops tonight's business news. Back at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, one day after acting Governor Sheila Oliver signed a law increasing protections for workers who believe they are victims of wage theft, 
The state is going after a company it says underpaid its workers. The Department of Labor says Time Food Services will have to provide $111,000 in back pay to 42 employees. Time Food operates as Berry Creek Cafe with three locations in the state. According to officials, the company wasn't paying overtime and in some cases was paying workers off the books. New Jersey is taking part in an international crackdown on securities fraud. It's called Operation Crypto Sweep, and it's focused on cyber currency investment schemes. The state issued two emergency orders today to stop cryptocurrency companies from doing business in the state, saying they were fraudulently offering unregistered securities. Those companies are Zoptax and Unical. According to the Division of Consumer Affairs, while not every cryptocurrency investment is fraudulent, there are significant risks involved with some products, such as an investor losing his or her money. There are few regulations around these types of investments. It has been a week of stock market volatility due to headlines related to China, trade and tariffs, but has New Jersey paid a price? The answer is yes, according to one group, which has put a price tag on what tariffs are costing U.S. companies. According to research released today by the Trade and Business Coalition, tariffs hurt the heartland. The Trump administration's tariffs cost U.S. businesses $3.4 billion in June. That is the first full month's impact of tariffs on $250 million worth of Chinese goods. The group used Census Bureau data to conclude that since the beginning of the trade war in 2018, American taxpayers have paid over $27 billion in extra costs on goods imported into the U.S., New Jersey residents paid $657 million. The financial markets roller coaster ride continued today on Wall Street. The Dow recovered from a nearly 600 point drop early to close down, but just by 22 points. And those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report is provided by SJ Magazine, the heart and soul of South Jersey, online at sjmagazine.net. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSE&G, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. Two more lakes have fallen victim to that rash-inducing algal bloom. At Bud Lake, the beach is closed while the water is being tested. At nearby Lake Muskinetcong, swimming, wading, and water sports are discouraged after the DEP confirmed harmful levels of cyanobacteria. That lake is still open, but the community association warns people away from drinking the water, letting pets near it, or eating fish caught there. Ocean City has a new weapon in the air war to keep boardwalk visitors and their french fries and funnel cake safe. Leia Mishkin met some members of the Flying Squadron. She's a new hawk, 17 weeks old. Uh, we're getting her acclimated to the boardwalk. There's a lot of sights and sounds and strollers and everything going on here so she's going to learn on the job. The job PJ Simonis is talking about is a sort of security position, keeping beachgoers safe from seagulls. The presence of a bird of prey scares them away from the boardwalk and back to the bay. Back into nature instead of in our world. They really shouldn't be eating fries. It's not good for them. The mayor of Ocean City says he contracted East Coast Falcons because seagulls were becoming more aggressive, attacking people and stealing their food. Every person who stopped to see the hawk had a story. He was eating his uh, potato chips or pretzels the other day, and as he was putting a pretzel, pretzel in his mouth, a seagull came over and took the pretzel out of his hand and hit my wife in the face. Emma, one of her friends, actually had a sandwich in her hand and got bit by a seagull. So it had a little cut on it, which was scary. The executive director of the Humane Society of Ocean City says they wanted to try a program that would keep the public and the birds safe. We, we met with the owner of um, East Coast Falcon and um, the other employees, and uh, they guaranteed us that they feed their birds before they take them up to the boardwalk. And since they are feeding them, they're, you know, they're not interested. They're just basically just chasing them away. This hawk will graduate from walking the boards to flying in about a week, but just its presence has a powerful effect on the seagulls. How far away can 
they spot this bird. Very far. Their life depends on it. So they're, that's how they're wired. Just the flap of her wings and the shape of her wings and everything that she does, you know, just triggers this kind of response in the birds. That call that they're starting to do, that's letting all the other seagulls know that there's a raptor in town. So what they're gonna do is call, they're gonna circle around, get eyes on the raptor, and then they're gonna move out. Depending on the situation, Simonis will be using a combination of hawks, owls, and falcons to clear the area of seagulls. These birds, we kind of use them and go rooftop to rooftop. The, the falcons will put up and they'll go out, grab a thermal and ring up to like 3,000 feet and hang out up there and wait for some movement. And at that point, once they're up 3,000 feet, there's basically nothing on this island that isn't in their danger cone. So they could come down and strike anything. So all the birds are very careful and nervous. Here in New Jersey, we don't have any owls that aren't nocturnal. So the only time a seagull would see an owl during the daylight would be if the owl was extremely, extremely hungry. So that really kind of twists their mind a little bit. They're all raptors, and raptors prey on seagulls. What we do is we control their weight so they'll actively pursue the birds, but they're really not looking to kill them. And then we call them down for their dinner. Even if they let them go, I'm their food source, so they're following me and watching me. Even if the falcon's up 3,000 feet, they're really good at picking out who we are. They, they understand from riding on your fist how you walk and how you move. 10 to 10, I'll be making sure that there's no seagulls around. It's a good start, but again, it's also the merchants up there have to be educated on how they hand out food to the public in uh, the, you know, the containers that they use. The birds don't see it, they're not gonna come down for it. The mayor of Ocean City plans to keep the program in place through August, and if it's successful, he'll bring it back next summer. She's gonna own this boardwalk. In Ocean City, Leia Mishkin, NJTV News. A pivotal decision ahead for a long-stalled natural gas pipeline. Owners of the controversial Penn East pipeline are expected to submit a new application to the State Department of Environmental Protection. NJ Spotlight's Tom Johnson's been working the story. Tom, what are the odds the 120-mile-long project will be given a go-ahead? Well, that's a tough question, but New York State stopped a project up there uh, on similar grounds, that it didn't meet water quality requirements. Uh, that's what uh, the environmental community here in New Jersey is hoping that the DEP will do when the project is finally comes up for review there. Okay, thank you, Tom. And you can sign up for their daily newsletter. Go to njspotlight.com and click on NJ Spotlight Newsletters. Federal security standards mean anyone without a valid U.S. passport who wants to board an airplane or enter a federal building will have to swap out their Jersey driver's licenses or non-driver ID for what's called a real ID by October 1st, 2020. And the Motor Vehicle Commission has to make changes, too. MVC Chair and Chief Administrator Sue Fulton gave an update to Chief Political Correspondent Michael Aaron. When is the Motor Vehicle Commission going to begin offering real ID driver's licenses? Well, that is a great question. We are rolling it out gradually. As I've said earlier, there are a lot of modernization and streamlining that, that needed to be done, uh, s steps that needed to be taken before we're ready for real ID. Um, right now, we've been in beta testing for a little over a month. We uh, two weeks ago, we downloaded fixes to 90 bugs. Now, that's not unusual. It's a major IT project, but we're trying to make sure that we get it fixed at every level. We did hit a, we did hit a, a, a snag. Um, the, all, you know, we have to scan each and every document um, in Real ID. That's one of the big changes. Every one of your identity documents that you bring in has to be scanned into the system. 
Well, in the previous administration, they bought scanners for all of the agencies. We found out when we did the first beta testing of issuing a, first, uh, issuing a real ID that uh, the scanner wouldn't work on a modern passport. Like any passport after like 2012, 2013, uh, they were too fat to fit in the feeder. So we had to stop. Um, we figured out a workaround so that we could continue testing, but we had to go and do procurement to get new scanners that would work. So, so take a guess. these are all these are all steps that are part of the beta testing. That said, our beta testing, we are actually issuing valid real IDs. Uh, we're doing it with volunteers from the Motor Vehicle Agency um, and from our partners at Homeland Security. Um, where uh, we provide them the information, they come in as testers, um, but the real ID that we issue them is a valid real ID. Now, what we plan to do is, as we get a few more um, locations up and running with the testers, we will then open it up to get um, um, beta testers, if you will, from the general public. When is that gonna happen? I can't give you a date right now. We're hoping to announce something very soon, but, um, um, my, I've promised my folks that I won't commit to a date until we're sure of the date. Um, a big part of this, you have to keep in mind, our IT group, just this year, just this year, we have replaced every one of our 39 Escala servers in our agencies. We have replaced our entire outdated credit card scanning system with a cloud-based point of sale system at every agency. We have upgraded our driver testing software, the written test that you take on screen at the agency, across every agency, all 39 agencies, or all driver testing locations have faster, more reliable software. We've done all of that just this year. We've added online services. If you lose your license, you lose your registration, you can replace it online. You couldn't do that before. That's a new, these are all IT the, projects. The, the public is less concerned with what's going on behind the scenes than with how inconvenient is this going to be for me? How long am I going to have to wait at a motor vehicle agency to get all these documents scanned and get, get my license? What's the answer? And the answer is, it's going to take you a lot less time because of all these things I'm talking about. We are speeding up every transaction at motor vehicle so that when we start doing real ID for everyone, that train is running so much faster than it was six months ago that your weight should not be, um, shouldn't be uh, unbearable. It shouldn't be what we've seen. And we've seen some states go to hours and hours of wait times. We do not, we are planning in a way that you won't have, you know, a six hour wait time, a four hour wait time. What is it going to be? We don't know because we are still implementing those changes. We're putting, we've put in these queuing systems in six of our agencies that is gonna to go to all 39 agencies. You take a ticket, it tells you what number you have for what transaction. And then you get a seat somewhere? Then you can have a seat and you can wait. You can see on the board what number they're on. You look up at the screen, you see the number that they're currently working on and you can see where your number is. Do you know how long that wait is? Not right now, but we are building the capability to not only tell you while you're sitting there roughly how long your wait is going to be, but we're building a capability that we can put wait times for each agency online. Now, all of that stuff is going to be, you know, it's not happening tomorrow. It's going to happen over, you know, months. But the idea is that as you do real ID, you're not going to run into, you're going to be able to plan for the amount of time. There's another piece that, um, that we are adding that we made a determination and part of the reason we're slow, um, we are slowly rolling out Real ID is we decided we would roll out the appointment system first. You, you can't get an appointment today unless you, you have a special situation. Um, we, are, we are currently piloting an appointment system and using it with all our volunteers. So every volunteer goes online and makes an appointment for Real ID. The, what that helps us with is as we get faster, our clerks are gonna get faster, okay? We know this, a clerk who's been working for 10 years is a lot faster at a driver license transaction than one who's been working for six months. As they get faster with Real ID, we can accelerate the appointments and see more and more people, but still, when you come in, you're coming in for an appointment. Sue Fulton, thanks very much. We'll have more with Sue Fulton tomorrow night.
Tomorrow on NJTV News, the governor's back in a Bell Labs. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. PSE&G is building New Jersey's clean energy future. We're working to protect our network against extreme weather, expanding and upgrading transmission lines, and modernizing our natural gas system by installing new, more durable underground pipes. At PSE&G, our goal is to make sure you have the safe, reliable energy you need to power your life now and into the future. For over 85 years, in every county across the state, we've protected the health of New Jersey, covering families and businesses through life's big moments and the small ones. Because we don't just work here, we live here too. Over 5,000 local employees, all with the same purpose, taking care of you.